today, Radio Church, I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. And this weekend is traditionally referred to as Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday weekend, it's the week uh, where we remember and we celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. And Typically, we'll preach from one of the gospel accounts of that, and then next weekend is the Super Bowl of the church. It's Good Friday, Passover, uh, and then Resurrection uh, Sunday that we celebrate on Saturday and Sunday. Jesus rising from the dead victorious over death, hell, and the grave. But this year, obviously, is a much different year than any other time that uh, I can remember in my lifetime, especially as we approach Easter. It's the first Easter that I remember that not only is the tomb going to remain empty, but our buildings are also going to be empty. And as we find ourselves at home on Good Friday and Easter, and then also this weekend, looking forward in time to when we gather back together again, uh, it, there's a sense that we all have that God is doing something in the midst of all of what kind of looks like chaos and in many cases is uh, challenging for families who are sick or know somebody who is sick. There's obviously a lot of fear and things that are taking place in the world. It doesn't take much. All you have to really do is turn on the news and uh, you'll see waste, worst case scenarios, places like New York and different places that are hot spots. And in the middle of all this, there are a lot of questions that are being asked. And uh, I'll tell you that as, as we've led the church over the last few weeks entering into these uncharted waters, uh, it's had me praying at a, uh, a level that I don't I, I unashamedly just say that I, I have never prayed before because I am making decisions that I've never had to make before, and I know that all of you are in much of the same type of a situation. And one of the prayers that I've been praying is this. It's, Lord, what is it that you are doing and saying in the midst of all of this? I understand the pandemic, the virus, the election year, the economy. I understand all of that. But Lord, what are you doing? Because I know this. I know that, Lord, you never waste a crisis. There's, there's, in fact, you don't waste anything. You take a hold of every moment, every opportunity, every, everything that is at your disposal, and you work it. In fact, you promise in Romans chapter 8 that you're working all things, all things, together for our good, for those who are who love God and are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, you, Romans 8, 28, you give us that promise that you're at work in the midst of stuff that we don't understand. And a lot of us probably find ourselves in that place, especially now as we're approaching the weekend where we celebrate the resurrection and we're not able to gather in church, even though it is the Super Bowl of the church. We, we step back and go, Lord, you're obviously doing something in the world. What are you also doing in the church? And in the midst of all of that, as I've been praying and seeking God, the Lord has brought me back to the book of Exodus because I really believe in my heart that there's some truth that uh, not only connects the story of redemption that's found in the cross and the resurrection that we're going to look at. But there's also a whisper in the midst of all of that that is the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to the church about a new exodus. And God is taking us out of some old mentalities and some old mindsets and some things that no longer line up with what he wants to do and see take place within his church. And the ripple effect of that is how it will impact and affect the world that is around us. I believe we are living in days that in decades from now, should the Lord tarry, we will look back and we will define these moments as tipping, points, tipping point moments that not only shaped history, but also shaped the church and prepared us to move out of slave mentalities and to shift into the armies of God 
ready for a great outpouring, revived and ready for a third great awakening that has a massive transformational effect upon our communities and upon our our societies and, and our nation as a whole and our generation. We are living in the midst of a generation that is the first generation that has never seen a revival or an awakening move of God. And I believe God is in the midst of retooling and renewing and reviving his church and preparing us for that. And he's doing it in the midst of the hour in which we are living in. So over the next couple of weeks, this weekend and next weekend and the following weekend, I've entitled the message that I'm going to be sharing out of Egypt, out of Egypt. And even next weekend, it's Resurrection Weekend, I'm still going to be talking about this and how it connects to what Jesus did when he rose from the dead. But today what I wanna do is I wanna start with Exodus chapter three. So if you're looking in your Bibles, Exodus chapter three, beginning in verse number one. It says, now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, and yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not come near or take off your sandals off of your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And then the Lord said, I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land to a good and a broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come up to me, and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt." The story of the Exodus is a, it's perhaps the single greatest foreshadowing archetype of God's redemptive intentions that would ultimately be fulfilled in Jesus and his finished work, his death upon the cross, and ultimately his victorious resurrection, more than any other story that we find in the Bible. It is God's redemptive explanation of himself. It's the raw, vulnerable, pull back the veil. This is who I am and this is my intentions. Not just with uh, the descendants of Jacob who find themselves in the land of Egypt. That was the starting point. But there's so much more in this story that is a type and a shadow that contains some truths and some examples that you and I can draw from. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in verse number 11, Paul writes about all of these Old Testament stories. In particular, God's dealing with the nation of Israel. And he says, all of these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition or our encouragement upon whom the ends of the age have come. And so Paul is reminding the church, when we read our Old Testament, when we read the stories of how God redeemed and saved the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, how he, out of, a, out of a, a mighty right hand, he parts the Red Sea, he brings them through victoriously. When we read these stories, he says that God did them so that you and I would have an example, or in other words, a picture 
of what his intentions all along have been for the whole world, to draw a people out of the world that would be his people. That when we see these, it's not just, hey, that's incredible that God did that at one point. And obviously that's where the Jewish people came from. And, and obviously there's, there's just miracle after miracle after miracle that we read in the story of the Exodus. God did not do that so we would sit back and read history but he actually intentioned it and wrote it in the pages of scripture so that history would actually become prophecy. It would become prophecy that would reveal to us his intentions, his desire, his all-wise eternal purpose and plan to redeem all people, not just through Moses, but through his son Jesus. When we get to the book of Exodus, we find that at the end of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, we see that the children of, of Jacob, you know, just a, a, a few of them, a uh, hundred or so, have settled in the land of Egypt because Joseph, who is second in charge over all the Egyptian empire, has invited them to come out of the land of Canaan to dwell in the land of Goshen in Egypt, which is a land next to the river. It's beautiful. It's got irrigation. It's perfect farming land, especially for raising sheep. They're agricultural. They're, they're herdsmen. And Pharaoh gave Joseph that land for his family. So Joseph had brought them in. But the Bible tells us in Exodus chapter one that after Joseph died and after the Pharaoh died, there arose another Pharaoh who did not remember Joseph. And so when he saw how prosperous the children of Israel were, when he saw how numerous they were becoming because they were multiplying on the land, he decided to enslave the children of Israel so that they would not rise up as an army and defeat Egypt. He made his decision out of fear and he utilized control in order to dominate them and actually utilize them for his purpose. And this goes on in the land of Egypt for over 400 years, 10 generations of children of Israel, they're continuing to multiply. By the time we get to the Exodus, where they actually leave Egypt, the Bible tells us that there's about 600,000 men. You add children and women into that, and we're probably looking in the range of 2 million of them. They started with just a, a 100 or so of them, and now over the course of 400 years, they've turned into a small nation. And Pharaoh has enslaved them for 400 years. And in that 400 years, they have cried out to God, God, deliver us, save us. Remember your promises. If you go back in the book of Genesis, God actually predicts that this was gonna happen to Abraham. When God made the covenant with Abraham, he says, your descendants are gonna go into a land where they're gonna be captives for 400 years or so. And during that time, I'm gonna deal with the, the Canaanites that are in the land, but then I'm gonna bring your descendants back up. But here they are for 400 years. I want you to think about 400 years. 400 years would take us back to 1620, just about 10 years after the King James Bible was translated. Think about 400 years of being slaves in a land that you thought was gonna be your temporary dwelling, crying out to God, do you not hear us? Do you not see us? Do you not care? And then at just the right moment, God reveals himself to a young Jewish man who is actually not that young, to be honest, has left Egypt. We know about Moses. He, he left Egypt at 40 years old because he killed an Egyptian slave. He was Jewish. He had been put into the little basket, sent down the Nile. Pharaoh's daughter pulls him out. His name actually is Moses, which means drawn out. He's raised up in Pharaoh's home. He's educated in all Egyptian ways of thinking. He goes to the best universities, the best schools. He's raised in a very affluent home. But now he's in trouble, so he leaves and he flees to Midian. And while he's in Midian, he meets this Midianite woman. He marries her. Her father's name is Jethro, and now here he is. He's taking care of his father's sheep. And it's the second chapter of Moses' life. He's wandering around taking care of sheep. He has probably forgotten all about Egypt. He's now close to 80 years old. 
and he's by himself on the mountain of the Lord. When one day he comes up along the the bush that he sees that's on fire, which isn't that unordinary except the fact that this bush is burning, but it is not consumed, which means he was paying attention to it for quite a while. And he says, I'm gonna check it out. And he goes over to it and God speaks to Moses out of the burning bush, reveals himself, tells him, take off the shoes that you are wearing for you're standing on holy ground. And he draws Moses once again, not out of a river, but he draws Moses out of retirement. And he says, Moses, I'm gonna send you back into Egypt. I'm the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I've heard the cry of my people. It's come up before me and I have seen their oppression. My heart has been moved. And now Moses, I'm gonna send you to go back and to bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I want you to go back. You're going to be raised up as a deliverer. (coughs) Moses in chapter three, verse 12, God gives him the promise, says, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. And when you have brought the people of, uh, when you have brought the people of Israel out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. And so the book of Exodus, the uh, the first several chapters of it are all about how God stepped into Egypt through Moses, his deliverer, and he broke the power of slavery. He overthrew the deities that the Egyptians worshipped, and he prepared and pulled out his people out of their bondage, and he begins the process of bringing them into the promised land. That would actually be a longer process than God actually wanted, that Moses assumed, but yet, nonetheless, God is faithful, and they arrive in the promised land ultimately. But it's, it's this massive story in which we find God sending Moses in as a deliverer. Well, what we know is this, that Moses is a type of Jesus. Moses is a type of Jesus, that God the Father sent Jesus, his son, into our world. Or let me put it to you in the way that Corey wrote in his new song that just got released called Egypt, where Jesus stepped into our Egypt. Moses steps into Egypt for the first time in 40 years. But this time, as he comes back into Egypt, he's on an assignment. He's on an assignment from God. He's a little reticent, but God has said, I'm going to be with you. And in the same way that Moses steps into the city limits of Egypt to announce to Pharaoh, the evil oppressor, let my people go so that they might worship me, that they might serve me, Jesus steps into history as the ultimate deliverer to set God's people free, to set humanity free that have been under the slavery and under the bondage to sin, under the oppression of the devil. Acts chapter 10 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all those who were sick and oppressed by the devil. Jesus is the ultimate deliverer. Moses steps into Egypt as the foreshadow of who Jesus would be. And he stands before Pharaoh and he says to him, God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahweh says to you, let my people go so that they might serve me. You see, these people had spent 400 years serving Pharaoh. And God is stepping into history and he's saying, they were not created to serve you, Pharaoh. Ultimately, they were created to serve me, to worship me. And the only thing holding them back is you. So I'm here to confront you and your pride and to break it if I have to in order to set my people free. And that's exactly what happens. Moses confronts Pharaoh. Pharaoh, it says his heart is hardened. He says yes, then he says no. And 
all of these, this leads to this outbreak of miraculous plagues that take place all over Egypt. And the plagues that God begins to unleash are not just random plagues. These are plagues that were targeting things in nature and things within Egypt that they attach deity to, gods that they actually worshiped. Like for example, when Moses turned the Nile to blood, they worshiped the Nile. Their ultimate God was the sun God. And so the sun went dark. Frogs, they worship frogs. And he says, you worship frogs? Here, have a whole bunch of them. And so frogs covered the land of Egypt. The pestilence and ultimately the firstborn because they believe that the firstborn, especially of Pharaoh, was a deity in and of himself. One by one, Moses as he begins to declare to Pharaoh, let my people go, and Pharaoh hardens his heart in his pride, God begins to expose these weak, demonic idols of the Egyptian culture and to overthrow them. And he's doing two things in the process. God is doing two things. Number one, he's saying to Pharaoh, I'm more powerful than you, and I'm more powerful than any of the gods or the idols of your culture. But the second thing that God is doing is he's showing off in front of the children of Israel so that they will remember who the God is that their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, worshiped. This is who I am. You wanna know who I am? You've thought I've forgotten about you, but let me show you who I am. You're so fearful of Egypt. You're so fearful of Pharaoh. You've been inundated for 10 generations by a culture that calls you by a serial number, by just slave, a culture that uses you to build its own self-interest. I'm gonna show you who I am. I am Yahweh, the God who fights for you. So you're afraid of the Nile? Well, watch what I do to the Nile. You're afraid of the sun? Well, watch what I do to the sun. You're afraid of the high priest? Watch what I do to the gods that they worship. You're afraid of the firstborn who is the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun? Let me show you what I do to Pharaoh's household. And God, one by one, begins to overthrow the idols of Egypt in the process, not only proving that he's more powerful than Pharaoh, but also in the process proving to his own people, the children of Israel that are called by his name, who he is. I am the God of miracles. I am the God who heard your cry. I'm the God who's not just off in the corner of the universe. I'm sure many of them thought, does God even hear our cries? Does God even care? until the day that Jesus steps into the city limits of Jerusalem. There were many people in his generation that asked that same question. I wonder if God even cares. I wonder if God sees us in our oppression. I wonder if God cares about the brokenness in our life until Jesus steps into the city limits in his triumphal entry. They all thought it was to set up his kingdom now. They had no idea that Jesus was going a step further to actually die on the cross for the sins of the world in order to set us free. You see, when Jesus stepped into the city, he stepped into the city so that he could lead us out of Egypt. His intentions were the same as Moses' intentions. I've come in in the name of the Lord to overthrow the idols, to confront Pharaoh, to set my people free. Why? Because God says, you belong to me. You wanna know what you were created for? You were created to worship me. There are promises attached to you that I have not forgotten. Promises and covenants that I have made with Abraham that I have not forgotten. And there is nothing that is going to stand in my way from drawing my people out of their oppression and to myself. Just as he told Moses, you're gonna bring them to the mountain, this mountain that I've revealed myself to you. I want you to bring the people back to this mountain so that they might serve me and worship me on this mountain. Now, when you look at the story of the Exodus, there's so much that is wrapped up in there, the types and the symbolism. Pharaoh represents the devil. Israel represents the people of God. Slavery represents sin and bondage. 
Passover represents the price of sacrifice and the blood and our faith attached to it. And the exodus through the Red Sea is symbolic, is foreshadowing of the resurrection of Jesus where he made a way where there is no way. He overcame death, parted the waters, and brought us out of darkness and into the light with promises and a promised land before us. There's so much in the story of the exodus. But what's interesting to me, when we start off and we just look at the very beginning of the story where here's God, this mighty God who steps in and says, I've heard the cry of my people. Moses' response to that revelation of God where he says, well, Lord, I can't speak. I'm, I'm old. I, 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 I can't do it. And God says, you'll do it because my presence will be with you. And Moses steps into Egypt and he confronts Pharaoh. What's interesting to me is the response of all of these people. Because we find a lot of, of their responses are actually very similar to the responses that people had towards Jesus when he ultimately came to redeem his people. And it has a lot to do with the responses that very often we have in our current everyday circumstances and situations and how we respond to God. Because make no mistake about it, Egypt hasn't gone away. And obviously, I'm not talking about the nation of Egypt. God loves the Egyptian people. Egypt is always a symbolic representation of the world and its system. The world that is broken, a system that is dominated by sin and oppression. You and I live in a fallen world, an Egypt, if you will. And all of us need a deliverer. We need a savior, and that savior is Jesus Christ. The reason why we all need a savior is because we have found ourselves in the place of slavery. We're enslaved to sin. But Jesus becomes our Passover, our 1 Corinthians 5. Let us keep the feast, for Jesus has become our Passover lamb. That they would celebrate right before the exodus Jesus has become our Passover. And if by faith we'll put the blood over the doorpost of our house, then when death tries to claim us, whether it be death ultimately at the grave or the spirit of death that constantly is moving throughout our land, death of our marriages, death of our dreams, death of our relationships, we can be fully alive but yet be filled with death or we can be fully alive and filled with eternal life. It all has to do with our response. So what was the response when Moses showed up? It's interesting. What was the response? Well, number one, the response of the people as Moses showed up and he told them what God's purposes and plans were, he went to the elders of Israel and he demonstrated that God was with him and he told them what God's intentions were. And their initial response was they believed him. It says in Exodus 4, 31, the people believed and when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their afflictions, they bowed their heads and they worshiped. That's an appropriate response. You could say it like this. They said the sinner's prayer. Somebody came and brought them good news, the gospel. A deliverer has come, Moses, and it says they believed faith and they bowed their heads. And this was their salvation moment where faith rose up in their heart. But Pharaoh's response was different. When Pharaoh was confronted by Moses, his response in chapter five, verse two was, who is the Lord? <laughs> who is Yahweh, the great I am? He says, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. His response was a response of pride and arrogance. I don't know the Lord. They belong to me. Those are my slaves. They're building my city. And in fact, he was so arrogant about it that then he went to the taskmasters of Israel, and he said to them, since they've got so much time on their hands to listen to this preacher Here's what I want you to do. When they make bricks to build my city, 
We're not giving them straw anymore to make the bricks with. They can go and get their own straw, but we're not going to reduce the number of bricks that they have to make. What did he do? He increased the oppression and the burden that was on them. And what did that produce in the people? Well, their response changed. In verse number seven, when they heard it, it says that the people said, Pharaoh said, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past, but let them go and gather them for themselves. And then chapter six, verse six, the people responded and the people of Israel said, or, therefore say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out under the burdens of Egypt and I will deliver you from slavery. Say this to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. But the people's response was when Moses said all this stuff to them, they said they did not listen to Moses. Here's why, because of their broken spirit and their harsh slavery. So let me, let me break it down for you. Moses comes and he meets with all the people and he says, I'm the deliverer, God is with me. I'm come here in response to the cry of your heart to set you free, God's gonna deliver you. And you know what, they said, yes, we believe that. We believe God's good. We believe he's gonna save us. We believe he's gonna deliver us. All right, so they bowed down their heads and they worshiped. Then when Moses went to Pharaoh and he confronted Pharaoh, Pharaoh said, I don't know who the Lord is, but who do you think you are? I'm not bowing to the name of your God. I've got my own gods and in fact, I am God. I'm not bowing to Yahweh. I'm not gonna bow to the I am that you say is the I am. In fact, I'm gonna increase the difficulty of the oppression on the children of Israel. And so when Moses takes that report back and the Jews had heard from their taskmasters that they don't get straw anymore, but yet they've got to make the same number of bricks. Now when Moses comes back to them and says, hey, hey, I just met with Pharaoh. Don't worry about Pharaoh. Don't worry what he said. It's going to get hard. I understand it. But let me tell you this. God's going to bring you out with a mighty right hand. It says that they did not listen to him. Why weren't they listening to him? They were too, liz- too busy listening to the voice of accusation from Pharaoh. The voice of the enemy had become louder in their ear than the voice of the deliverer, than the voice of their God. And the reason why that had happened, it's found right there in verse number nine. It's because they had broken spirits and they had lived under harsh slavery. See, this is what sin does to us. We hear the gospel and it's good news to us. But then when the enemy pushes back on our lives, pushes back against us with temptation, he begins to remind us of who he says we are. Then what we do is we turn our eyes away from the promises that God has made and the deliverance that he's paid for. And we pay far too much attention to the voice of the taskmasters and the oppressors in our life because of the slavery that we've experienced. It's talking about our past and also the bitterness in our spirit. You know, it's it's bitter when you've tried over and over and over again to build your life, to make a life that's worthwhile to live in an Egyptian system, but to know that you're really a slave. Do you know the Bible says that, in Romans chapter six, it says that without God, without Jesus, without the deliverer, all of us are slaves to sin. Even Jesus said it. Think about these words. Jesus in John chapter eight, verse 34 says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever, but a son remains forever. And then listen to this. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. It's hard to live in Egypt. It's hard to live in this world without God. Because just as Romans says, just as Jesus said, we're all slaves to sin. We're born slaves to sin. And the devil, he's like Pharaoh. He doesn't pull back, lighten the load. He doubles down. And he's the accuser. He's the threatener. He cracks the whip. 
And all throughout our lives, we've learned to survive. We've learned to play by the rules of Egypt because we just want to survive. We just want to get through. And we've, we've become experts at how to try, how to build a life, how to build brick by brick by brick. And it's just like the enemy to step in and say, you're not gonna even have straw to make your bricks. What is that? It's impossible. It's a burden. It's how the enemy works. And we're weighed down by, and sometimes we've lived in an Egyptian system and we've been dominated by sin and we've believed the lie that we are slaves, have always been slaves, and are destined to always be slaves. And so we believe that's who we are, and it's actually become bitter in our soul, and it affects our outlook on life. It affects our dreams. It affects our relationships. We're bitter of heart in our marriage. We're bitter about our job. We have no hope for our financial future because we've tried. And just when things have gotten a little bit better than they were, then they're pulled out from underneath us. And we've heard the crack of the oppressor's whip. And you know what religion tells us? It tells us, if you just try a little bit harder, you can build a better life. If you just strive a little bit more, things might improve. You know what the voice of Pharaoh says? It's never getting better. Your sin, that's who you are. Your sin, you should be ashamed of yourself. He's there to condemn us. He's there to abuse us, to oppress us. But you see, just like Moses stepped in with good news, Jesus steps into our Egypt and he announces to us, that's not at all who you are. I've come to set you free. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. And I've come to set you free. And what Jesus did at the cross, we're gonna talk about Passover on Good Friday. There's so much significance there. But what Jesus did on the cross is exactly what Moses did in Egypt. He overthrew the idols and the false gods and the false securities of this world. He disarmed them when he went to the cross. Colossians chapter two says, all the written accusations that were written against you, all the laws that condemned you as guilty as a criminal, made you a slave, they were all nailed to the cross when Jesus was on the cross. And it says he disarmed principalities and powers. He, Moses disarmed the Nile. Moses disarmed the sun. Moses disarmed Pharaoh himself. Jesus disarmed the devil. Jesus wiped away all the accusations of sin and shame and guilt that had been written against you. And he nailed it to the cross, our Passover lamb. He took it all on himself. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. When Jesus stepped into our Egypt, when Jesus went to the cross, he did it not to make us better sinners. See, Moses didn't go to Egypt to make Egypt a more comfortable place for the slaves to live. He went into Egypt to deliver them out of Egypt. Jesus didn't come as a community organizer. Jesus didn't come to make us more comfortable in an Egyptian system. Jesus didn't come to make us nicer sinners with less sin. Jesus came to make slaves sons, to make bond servants daughters, and to bring us out from the oppression of the devil, to break the bonds of sin, to break the shackles of wickedness and unrighteousness, and to bring us out of the death of Egypt through the Red Sea of his resurrection, 
filled with the Spirit of the living God and to take us into the promised land. That's what Jesus came to do. Jesus is the greater deliverer. He comes to remind us tonight. Comes to remind us of who we are. Who he is and who we are. We're not meant to live under the bondage of fear. You were never meant to live under the sway and the dominion of sin's power in your life. We were all born into sin, but you were called out of darkness into light. If you're listening to me today, and you know as you look at your own life, you've been living in the land of Egypt, and you've been crying out to God, God, save me. God, if you're there, do you even care about me? Do you hear me? God's answer to you is yes, I've heard the cries of my people. I've heard your cry. I've seen inside of your heart, I know the pain that you're experiencing. I know how fearful you are. But can I just tell you, Hebrews tells us in chapter two that the devil has had the power of death and he uses it to control us by fear all of our lives. <laughs> Jesus came to set us free from fear. Jesus came to set us free from sin. And if you're finding yourself today under the shadow of an oppressor in the land of Egypt, Jesus says to the enemy over your life, let my child go, set him free. You know what religion tells us? Religion tells us you're gonna make bricks without straw. It's the voice of religion that says, just work harder, strive more. Jesus says, you don't have to make bricks. You are a living stone. You're not making something, you are something. You're not a slave, you're a child of the living God. The Bible tells us when he led them out of Egypt, his intentions were in, he, in Exodus chapter 12, I think it's verse number 51, it says, God announced, when I bring my people out of Egypt, when I bring them out after I've overthrown the Egyptian powers, here's how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna lead them out. In, in the New King James, it says, I'm gonna lead them out according to their armies. You know, I was reading that the other day and I saw something I've never seen there before. Israel's been in Egypt for 400 years. They've never been an army. They've never had an army. All they've ever been is slaves. But when God leads them out of Egypt, he doesn't lead them out as slaves. That's not how he sees them. It's not what he's created them to be. He says, I'm leading you out by your armies. See, the way that you come out of the world is different than the way you were born into it. You were born in sin, but you come out as a child of God. You come out as a soldier in the army of God. He sees us so radically different. And let me just tell you something. I believe in the hour that we are living in right now, all the things that are going on in the world, we can sit back and we can allow fear to grip our hearts or we can ask the question, God, what are you doing? And I'll tell you, one of the things that God is doing is he is dismantling the gods of Egypt right in front of our eyes. Even in the church, he's taking things that we've depended on and he's grinding them to powder. He's taking our bricks and he's saying, you're no longer, you're no longer gonna make bricks anymore. I don't want a religious system inside of my church. I don't want people that are just, have a therapeutic view of God that God's gonna make them feel better because God doesn't want happy slaves. God wants joyful sons. God doesn't want his church to be filled with people with a slave mentality, bitter in spirit, who listen to the voice of Pharaoh before they listen to God. God wants those who, according to Romans chapter eight, who are no longer slaves of fear, but now have a spirit of adoption on the inside of them that cries out, Abba, Father. All across this nation, all across this land right now, God is awakening his people. He is showing himself strong even miraculous in this hour. And he's saying, I am the mighty God and I am not content to leave you in Egypt. I'm not content to leave you in your past. I'm not gonna leave you in the bondage of your sin. I'm breaking the power of Egypt and I'm saying, let my people go. 
I'm bringing them out of Egypt. Let my people go. Give me back my church. Those in this generation that are far away from me, prodigals that grew up in church but have got wrapped up in the Egyptian system, Jesus is saying, let my people go. Let the prodigals come home. Let the lost come home. Let the crippled go. Let the blind see. Let the captive be set free. For I am announcing this is the year of the favor of the Lord. He is bringing us out of Egypt. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I declare that. Right where you're at today, I wanna to invite you to bow your heads with me. Right in your living room, it doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter who you are. Because right now, here's what I know, the voice of the enemy to a lot of us is saying, well, this doesn't apply to you. You're not that guy, you're not that woman. You know what, he doesn't know where you've been, he doesn't know what you've done. The enemy re is reminding a lot of you of your past, your worst moments. He's trying to lie to you and tell you that you are defined by your sin. And I want you to know that right now, wherever you are, Jesus is stepping into your Egypt. He's here today in this moment. He's heard the cry that you have let out the cry of your own soul that maybe you don't even know is there. And he said, I've drawn near, I've come down with intentions to redeem and to rescue. And I believe that one of the things that is gonna be a marker, a, a sign and a wonder out of this era, this moment that we are in is this, as a, a community, as a culture, is there are gonna be many, many, many people who went into this crisis as slaves and come out of Egypt as sons and daughters. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I want you to just bow your heads with me wherever you're at. And I can't see you, but what's most important is that he sees you. He sees you. And today, Father, we cry on you the God who fights for us. Jesus, you went to the cross and you fought for us. You laid down your life so we could take your life up. You were our perfect sacrifice. You, Jesus, are our great deliverer. And you said, if anyone will call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. And right now, wherever you are listening from, whatever platform you are on, I want you to know, God sees you and he stepped into your moment right now. He's here. And you have a decision to make. You can either choose to listen to the voice of Pharaoh and remain bitter in your heart and weary in your soul or today you can stand up and you can follow Jesus out of Egypt. Today you can say, I believe in you, Jesus. I believe that you are Savior. I repent of my sin, the thing that enslaved me. And today I, I surrender it. I lay it at your feet. I say, you can have it all. In return, Lord, today would you call me son or daughter? Would you give me a new life? I wanna be born again in Jesus. I accept you. As my Lord and my Savior, I receive you into my life and I turn my back on Egypt. I turn my back on the world. I'm turning my back on my sin. And from this day forward, I'm following you, Jesus. I belong to you. Come into my heart, save me, rescue me, deliver me, forgive me. In Jesus' name, amen.